Welcome back, Spy fans. Uh, we've been gone for about a week. Todd and I had a discussion about uh, switching up the formats because a lot of you have asked for uh, TV shows and uh, we kind of talked about it. And so we're going to start with the new format for shows and keep our uh, movie length ones separately. Um, and we're starting that off with The Night Manager. Starring Tom Hiddleston and Hugh Laurie. It was uh, adapted from a John Le Carré novel by the same title and aired in 2016. It's a story that follows a you know, night manager. Yeah, go figure. Working at this really high end hotel named Jonathan Pine, who's played by Tom Hiddleston. Uh, he stumbles on some really disturbing information that leads him into helping British intelligence. Uh, take down this international weapons dealer, uh, Richard Roper, who's played by Hugh Laurie. Um, his main contact with uh, British intelligence is Angela Burr, played by Olivia Coleman, which I know, Todd, you'd said you're kind of a big fan of. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I wouldn't say big fan, but uh, I, I, I did admire her work in a couple of comedy series, uh, British comedy series. Uh, back in the day, um, I'm blanking on the name. It's a, it's a, it's a comedy duo. And then, well, there was their show and then there was, uh, their, their sitcom was called peep show. Um, oh, okay. and it was the previous one was the, the blank and blank show, uh-huh. you know, uh, kind of like a key and peel kind of thing, but with British guys instead of black dudes. So. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I was I was I was surprised and impressed to see her in a, a dramatic role, and uh, I I really I, I like her. I like yeah, her. it's it's really interesting to see her in a dramatic role, and I've already seen the whole series, and I think you're caught up on it. And she she was fantastic, right? you know, especially among like heavyweights like Hugh Laurie and Tom Hiddleston. So I yeah, think- I think I think all three of them nabbed uh, Golden Globes for this one. Oh really? Oh, I didn't even spot that. That's awesome. They definitely deserved it. <laughs> all, all three of them definitely deserved it. Um, but yeah, like I said, um, it, it follows a night manager who's working at these really nice hotels. Uh, he kind of gets into this little romance with a guest who happens to be kind of the mistress for like this really uh, like wealthy figure in Cairo, Egypt. Mm -hmm. Um, And she passes him like financial documents that are incriminating for Richard Roper uh, as this huge international weapons dealer, as well as the local figure in Cairo. And he submits the documents to British intelligence, which kind of gets things in trouble. Uh, And, um, you know, to kind of spoil a little bit before we get into some of the trade craft, his, his goal at this point after discovering um, the idea of them just finding out about the, the arms deal going down has been leaked to Richard Roper kind of puts this woman in his life in danger. So his goal kind of in the first act is keeping her alive, uh, which, you know, sadly he, he's not able to do. And it kind of really fucks him up and puts a lot of guilt on him. But meanwhile, throughout this kind of like first act, there's tons of tons of little trade craft with this, guy who's just a night manager but i, I guess he's kind of ex-military which kind of like adds up for it but um i don't, I don't know what, what, what are some of your favorite moments as far as like this like where he's working at the first hotel oh let's see uh favorite moments at the in in cairo well i like uh actually i actually kind of like the fact that uh they they lay out this you know that he the the um the Arab Spring is happening. This is the year that they set it in of 2011 when uh, I think it was Mubarak, uh, the dictator right. of Egypt, uh, was finally overthrown. And this right. is just about to happen, just about to happen as the show starts. Um, what I what I like is, uh, you know, uh, you know, we start out with like all these, you know, protests in the streets. Everything's dangerous. All the white people want to get the fuck out of Dodge. <laughs> and, right. uh, you know, and he shows up for work and, uh, you know, his coworker is like, how the fuck did you get here? And he's like, well, I just walked. <laughs> uh, right. And the guy's like, you're fucking crazy. And, and he says, well, I've seen worse. And this is important to me because um 
they they need to make sure they put in these little uh, tidbits to mm-hmm. let us know that our our night manager is actually a secret badass, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Because, because actually, to be honest, on my very first watching, I was a little tipsy and I didn't quite catch that. And I was kind of confused. Like, is this guy a spy? Like, what's his background? Why is he good at any of this? Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> right. but, you know, on this, on this last pass, just rewatching it again, like I noticed, like they, they feed these little things in. That was one of them. Um, I think also there's some, I mean, it's played off as like, uh, part of the tragic romance, but um, you know our 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 lady that's gonna uh, be the source of this information and get killed for it. She makes you know some comments about him having like multiple like person multiple faces that he shows to her at different uh-huh. times, and so I kind of like that too as setting up the idea that. I mean, it's it's not the most elegant way to do it in the world, but it's there that right. at least some character has commented to his face about like, you know, you're actually kind of good at pretending, like changing uh, facades. Right. Absolutely. Like, and, and you're right. Like, there's a, there's a lot of little statements or looks or glances or like decisions he makes just right off the bat. Like when when he's telling the lady, oh, trust me, the hotel is the safest place. The lady that just wants to leave the safest place, and then there's like an explosion or a gunshot, and he 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 like tackles her to the ground to protect her. Like there's all these little tiny tidbits to set him up as like a capable person. So it's more believable that we have this quote unquote every man that falls into this situation. That yeah, maybe he can pull some of this stuff off. He's not he's not just a nobody, and and it's later that we discover like you know. Uh, his buddy in uh, the British embassy is like an old war buddy that they were like, you know, like in the military together. So it's I like, I think he really pinned on like one of the main things that makes this whole first episode great is the setup really making a lot of it believable. Right. And I mean, I have seen, I have seen later episodes. Uh, not that we're here to talk about those yet, but this one is almost really kind of functions as a prologue episode yeah. to the other five right in in a lot of ways uh absolutely and you know to more of your point that we have like a really capable uh you know every man character uh wh- one of the things i really liked is at every moment you start to notice those that he's like withholding information or he's like playing things carefully so when he discovers about you know this big weapons deal he doesn't go to the authorities immediately he goes to like one of his kitchen staff guys that he obviously trusts and he trusts like they trust each other he's like hey you know there's like a meeting that i'm kind of trying to find out about can you ask some people around the kitchens and the hotel because you know in a, in a place like cairo and everybody like you know the high society life like I'm sure all of the staff kind of know each other at different hotels. You know, they probably drink at the same bar or something. So he doesn't he doesn't go and try and you know be a desperado. He he's actually trying to play it cautiously. And when he can't get much out of that, he even like calls a hotel that he knows. You know the uh, you know it's one of the Hamids that are like the the main wealthy figures in Cairo. He calls the hotel that he's staying at to, and pretends to be someone else. Hey, well I was supposed to meet him for dinner. Do you know where he is? And he finds out that he's meeting on the yacht with Roper. It, so it's all these little things. And and, and I, I really enjoyed that as well, is how, how much it was like cultivated. Um, and and that's that's really what leads us into like this setup that once that that paperwork, those transactions, the documents that have like the financial information. By the way, what, what did you think about that? Like, do you think like some black market arms deals are, are going to have like a invoice with like napalm and like eight, eight, 10 airplanes on them. That that's something that kind of was weird to me. Well, I did, I did because I didn't, uh, on close scrutiny, at least I don't see how he made the, the leap from what is it? Iron, iron cast, iron clad. Uh-huh. Anyways, the name of the company, uh, to, Richard Roper. Um, I know he had the name Mr. Roper, right. but he had never heard Richard. So 
uh, when he goes and Googles, you know, like, okay, so he's, uh, I think it's called Ironclad. Iron, Iron Last or Iron Cat. Yeah, something like that. Right. Um, with only the name Roper, like, it, I don't know. It's it's a quibble. It's a tiny little dropped uh-huh. ball. But, um, yeah, like, he, he should have needed the name Richard to actually, uh-huh. like, Google up and find Roper because, you know, Roper is not the most uncommon name in the world. Uh-huh. Um, and then uh, the other thing. Let's see. What was the other thing with that? Oh, right. I mean, in later episodes, we're going to see that Roper is extremely cautious about keeping his fingerprints off of the company. You know, uh-huh. it's like he runs these shell companies uh, that have that have no visible attachment to him at all. So also it means that like his name was not in those documents at all. So um, I thought, you know, it was it was a little hop over a puddle. Right. <laughs> uh, to to connect the name Roper to the actual Richard Roper that's the person of interest uh, and like the villain of the story, Hugh Laurie. Right. Yeah, I I don't know, there's a little inconsistency for that to be uh, yeah, as well. Um but regardless, the documents get in the hands of uh British intelligence and uh that's when we meet one of our other heroes, which is Angela Burr. And um, she gets the documents. One of the things I really liked tradecraft wise was she, she apparently like just from the dialogue between her and her team, you know, it, 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 we get the sense that she's been chasing Roper for her whole life, you know, or like a good chunk of her life. Oh yeah. It's a total, it's a total like um, captain, captain Ahab white whale, Moby Dick kind of situation. Right. And, and so she asked one of her, you know, people on her team or assistants or whatever to go pull files on Roper. And he's like, oh, this will set off red flags everywhere. And she's like, so, so just grab stuff about uh, British citizens, uh, you know, abroad. So like she, she described it as hide, hide it in a pile of slurry. And I thought that was kind of cool. She's like, we'll make it look like we're looking for a needle in the haystack. Um, so I, I, I never thought of that. Like if you're worried about like, like uh, you know, triggering some high up moles or something, uh, making it obvious, you wouldn't be like, I want to know about Richard Roper. You're just like, just send me a bunch of stuff about this really broad subject that I know would contain stuff about Richard Roper, and that way we're not triggering any like, you know, like stepping on any toes or setting off any alarms. And um, you're and you're right, but what they failed to do was to uh, give the foundation. For her oh. paranoia about the main MI6 people finding out about this, because we're actually we're we're gonna find out that um, these files were distributed to like everyone in the network. These files oh. didn't just go to her, oh. which answered one of my questions, like why her? Um, <laughs> but uh, apparently, like you know, got distributed like to everyone. So even though she doesn't know it necessarily right away when she gets the papers, uh, those papers also went to uh, what they call River House. This is the first time I've ever heard the headquarters of MI6 described this way, but, uh, uh-huh. you know, I'll take their word for it. Right. Um, it's a great, I, well, what, it's a cool it name. A river. Yeah, it's a great name. I th- I th- it was in front of a river, literally, it looked like, right? When they first had the subtitle, like, River House, MI6 headquarters or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a- a- absolutely. Uh, but, um, you know, I mean, we'll find out that she's right to be paranoid, but the episode itself didn't, uh, ever give us, and I don't think anything later in the series ever did either. I mean, we know, uh, again, like you said, like, or at least we'll find out that she's been on top of Roper's trail for a long time and that he's been extremely difficult to track, but they didn't specifically ever say that she's got reason to suspect, you know, um, that that her difficulties in nailing him uh, have to do with with moles or leaked information, right? Um, and especially with the, it, kind of gives you the sense that Roper has this enormous, like, wealthy, like, reach across business and politics all over the world. So, I, yeah. It, it it didn't really well establish it, but it was kind of just in the background, and and I guess we don't even really get much of an answer later. Um, 
But anyway, it turns out that that there is someone on the inside and Roper gets wind of it. And uh, Hamid, who, uh, you know, uh, Pine's contact is like the mistress of Hamid, some like big wealthy figure in Cairo, beats her up. And this this like kind of, uh, you know, leads Pine to believe that you know, uh, the, the woman's name is Sophie, that he's kind of got this romance with. She's not safe. So he's going to take her to a safe house and try and get her extradited out of the country because she provides such wonderful inform- intelligence to to Britain that kind of, you know, you don't, you don't want like these black market weapons trades going in like the wrong hands, you know? And uh, we find out he like fought in Iraq or something. And so he's seen what a lot of these mass weapons could do to a body and to people. And it was kind of disturbing to him. Um, but uh, well, he talks to his buddy at, at the British embassy to try and get her extradited. And he's like, no, it's a terrible idea. Um, the, you know, uh, the Hamids as well as Roper have reach all over England and she has no friends. She'd be safer with Hamid. I, I don't know if I buy that. And what, do you, what do you think? Oh, thanks. Thanks for bringing it up because, yeah. you know, the line, the line he gives is that flying out of the country would be an admission of guilt. Uh, I think fly, flying out of the country would be an admission of my boyfriend just beat the shit out of me. Right. And <laughs> And I I don't want to deal with that anymore. Right. I, uh, I got a black eye and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't I don't see the danger in connecting those dots. As we're gonna see, her coming back does turn out to be a bad idea, it gets her killed. Um yeah. Burr knew that uh the green light was was hit on Sophie's mm-hmm. life, right? Um, because she makes a, a, you know, a panicked call to Pine, mm-hmm. uh, the night manager, uh, saying, you got to get her out. You got to get her out. He's not in time. She's dead. Now, this call that Burr made to Pine was made immediately after she told her assistant, hey, get uh, uh, get me uh, Ogilvy's number. Ogilvy is the guy at the embassy right. that is an old buddy of Pines. It's it's the guy he gave the papers to mm-hmm. that then got distributed all across the uh, British intelligence services. Mm-hmm. It's also the guy that he's going to to say like uh, you got to get uh, you got to get her out of here. So I mean, can we drill in a little on like who's who's being stupid here and 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 how yeah. stupid? Yeah, <laughs> uh, you, you you want to take that? Uh, I I think it's a bad uh, uh, like argument from Ogilvy that oh it's like he, he, Hamid's have friends all over uh, London. They buy properties. They're building hotels. You know she has no friends. You know this even if even if she couldn't go to London, she could at least get out of the country and go somewhere else. And Pine grew up in England. He probably has friends and family somewhere. Like, he's obviously resourceful enough to have a friend out in Cairo that he could take her to his safe house, you know. Uh, so I, I don't buy the argument that it's not safe for her to leave, um, especially later when Angela's like, no, you got to get her the fuck out of the hotel. Um, but uh, what, what really he is, bug- he is yeah, kind of he is a bit of a loner, though. Right, right. Yeah, he does kind of seem like he, he likes his solace or something like that. Uh, but um, what, what really did bug me is when Ogilvy says no, and he, like the the safe house he takes it to seemed to be like a day trip type of like distance. Like he just calls her on the phone. And is like, oh, by the way, I can't extradite you. And and then she hangs. Oh, I see one of your many faces. And then she hangs up on him and decides to show up at the hotel, which is what gets her killed. And I'm not quite sure why he called her. He he should have kind of seen her in person and explained to her the situation. Well, I had a little bit of a difficulty with him uh, driving her out there personally, too, because with the psychotic Freddie Hamid, you know, out out for blood and having specifically told him, like, you know, um, you see her, you call me. Like right. right away, like uh, you know, I feel I've I feel I felt worried that Hamid was going to show up at the hotel and say, "Where's the night manager, the guy I talked to last night?" And they're going to be uh, like, "He didn't show up for work tonight." 
<laughs> right. <laughs> and now that's like, you know, I'm I'm flying a big, big red flag on that. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. But just to just to make sure uh we thread this needle too, so um you know, so whatever it's off screen, but at some decision, at some point the decision was made, like on the villain's side, Sophie's the league killer. Uh-huh. Right. Um that happens again, it's after it's after Pine told Ogilvy that Sophie was his source. And uh-huh. I did that kind of out of panic because he wanted to get her out of the country. Ogilvy's the guy he knows that could possibly arrange this but also the the situation that they're in where she needs to get out of the country is because you gave Ogilvy, Ogilvy some information and it clearly came right back like a boomerang uh, you know uh, uh you know you 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 put the information out and the villains immediately apparently caught wind of it uh-huh. so take some precautions about like, you know, the, the channels of communication that you used before that got you into this situation in the first place. Right. I understand Pine is panicked, but Ogilvy, I think, cause we've seen Pine have the conversation with him where he basically tells him Sophie is the source. Uh-huh. Um, Something is happening off screen where Angela Burr is going to talk to Ogilvy and then suddenly know that Sophie's life is in danger. I deduct from that, I deduce from that, that Ogilvy also, uh, after talking to Pine about the extradition and telling him no, London's not an option, that he also reported that Sophie was the source. Uh Uh-huh. And then when Burr calls Ogilvy, he gives her that information. That's enough for her to call Pine and say, you got to get her the fuck out of here. It's Ogilvy, I think, is the biggest idiot. Like, if we're going to put a dunce cap on anyone in this situation. (laughs) Yeah. Because I I forgive Pine a little bit because he's not a professional. Ogilvy's supposed to be. I think think Ogilvy is our our big dummy uh, in this episode. Definitely. Uh, I, I mean, I, I still feel Sophie coming back to the hotel is like, hey, I'm out. Like, leaving the safe house was not a great idea. But I think you're right that Ogilvy is definitely um, probably the most to blame out of a lot of this. Um, but whatever. Uh, she ends up getting herself killed coming back to the hotel. You know, Angela's warning is a little too late. Um and, uh, you know, it, it really weighs on Pine how much, you know, like he, he was responsible for her death. It so, becomes his primary motivation as a character right. in the story. Right. Exactly. Second, secondary motivation being like, you know, he, you know, just like any uh, living, breathing human being, but especially one that's seen the horrors of war that he hates, uh, you know, weapons of mass destruction. But at the core of a story character, his huge motivation going through the show is avenging Sophie's death. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and that also, and that also comes into play too, like where like, uh, you know, the, the detective, I mean, when he reports the murder and the Cairo police show up and the Cairo police is like, I never heard of the Hamids. Right. Maybe (laughs) you killed her. Like it's so obvious. Yeah. And, And so it's, um, it's a blatant uh, disregard of justice. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, like he, I I think um, Pine wouldn't necessarily have gone like, you know, full Avenger vigilante, anything to avenge Sophie's death. If it weren't for the fact that it's just shoved right in his face, that there's going to be no justice whatsoever. Right. Right. And and it's this Otherwise, it's this yeah. like yeah it's this like blatant disregard for right and wrong and justice and the reach of the Hamids and Roper that you know he feels kind of powerless and his response to that is I'm just gonna leave Cairo and I'm gonna be a night manager in the middle of like 
you know, bumfuck nowhere, sweet uh, Switzerland at some, you know, ice chalet hotel type of place at the top of the Alps somewhere, way in the middle of nowhere. You know, to, he, he just kind of runs from the situation and doesn't want to deal with it. Um, but as chance would have it, Pine comes face to face with Richard Roper himself, who actually comes to sit, stay with his whole posse and I guess some clients or business contacts at that very Swiss hotel that Pine just happened to decide to transfer or move to. Huge coincidence. Yeah, en- yeah, enormous coincidence. Uh, it's 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 annoying uh, to look at, like very logically, but uh, it's it's very well smoothed over by the fact that. Uh, you know, and Hugh Laurie is kind of, they were smart too to uh, show us Hugh Laurie's character, Roper, at the very beginning of the episode, just right. giving his speech so that like, and, and also we know that Hugh Laurie is going to be in the show. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, like for a big part of this episode, he's, he's, ne- he's not on screen. So it was right. smart to, to give us a little tease of him. And this big coincidence, I think, is so... Uh, beautifully papered over as an audience member by the fact of Roper and his entourage showing up in Switzerland. They are just fucking full of rich and rich big dick energy. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great way to describe it. Because as soon as they show up on the scene, that's exactly how it feels. Hollander, <laughs> Hollander is on top of his shit. Uh-huh. Uh, we get Elizabeth. What is it? Bicchetti. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, Elizabeth. Um, Debicki. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. Hugh Laurie. He's got his big dick brass balls, rich energy. Uh, you know, the, the two frisky and tabby. Uh, uh-huh. The two security guards are just like fucking perfect. It just it's so it's so much fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, they they're just like whatever. We're here. These are our expectations. You, you know, here do this and that. Like it's like they own the place. Um, but uh, there was a package waiting for Roper. There was, um, and. I really liked, you know, and this goes back to what Todd and I were talking about earlier about the competence of our main character being believable um, as as like withholding information. He doesn't deliver the package to Roper right away. He holds on to it, takes them and escorts them to the room, you know, observes the situation. And that's when Roper asks about the package. But, you know, uh, I, I think um, Pine kind of figures out that Roper is getting rid of like those cell phone chips, you know, like the SIM cards. Um, And that's like valuable. And so when he goes back to, you know, when Roper asks about the package, he's like, Oh, I'm not sure it came. I'll, I'll I'll have somebody look and send it up to you. He goes back and he checks the contents and there's new SIM cards. So uh, I, I thought that was really cool that he withheld that information, even though it already arrived. They gave him the bargaining chips, you know, and a lot of intelligence is protecting secrets, you know, and it gaining an edge. And, and I thought that was really well played for him. On top of that, he let's, doesn't deliver the package. Oh, did let's you wanna... give let's give uh, let's give Roper's crew and oh. or Roper personally uh, some spy points just for this idea of like, you know, because uh, I guess it it. It, it didn't exactly read to me, and I think there might be a little bit of missing connective tissue in it. It, it makes sense at the end, for sure. Right. <laughs> uh, but um, Tom Hollander, uh, who uh, we're going to call Corky, because uh, <laughs> because Roper, Roper has this delightful... We're going to... I, I want to talk about this more in future episodes, but he's got this delightful habit of giving everyone a nickname. Right. Did you notice that? <laughs> yeah. He's got, he's got cute little nicknames for everybody. <laughs> right. It's a total, like, it's kind of like a, almost like a Donald Trump kind of play, like ego uh-huh. play. I think. Uh, yeah. I want to talk about that in later episodes. Cause we're going to get to know all these people a lot better and their whole, like, uh, I don't know. Uh, they're they're kind of a family in a way. Uh-huh. Uh, 
slash gang slash I don't know, you know, but Roper in his entourage. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see. Why did I bring this up? Oh yeah. So, because, uh, so we're going to mostly call him Corky cause that's what most people call him. <laughs> All yeah. these people get very used to calling each other by the nicknames that Roper is assigned to them. Um, <laughs> Corky played by Tom Hollander. He's on the phone and Roper is kind of a little annoyed, like just slightly annoyed. He's like, I thought we were getting rid of these things. And, uh, sorry, circling back is what I wanted to point out is let's give the plus by points to Roper for the idea. Like, yeah, we're going to go to Switzerland for the meeting. And as soon as we get to Switzerland, everyone fucking shit your fucking SIM cards into the garbage. Uh, I've already sent ahead and arranged to have a package for all brand new SIM cards. Yeah, no, definitely plus five points on Roper's part. Yeah, Uh, that's definitely like... You know, I to me he's just such a heavyweight. I just like overlooked that. Like, yeah, it's assumed that he would do that, but no, it's it definitely deserves some some notoriety of like, yeah, he's very cautious. You don't get to the level of an international, you know, arms dealer like him without being careful. And this, this is one of the things that keeps his ass like safe, right? Um, but one of the cool things was disposing of the SIM cards. He, he's like eating pistachios and pours out like all the champagne. And and instead of just like tossing the SIM cards like randomly, he mixes them in with the pistachio shells and just drops them into the champagne bottle. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he's always on, you know, he's constantly like watching his ass. So nobody like, you know, the only person he doesn't trust really in the room is possibly Pine and, He's kind of like faking out pine with like a little magic trick. Oh yeah, I'm just tossing these pistachios in the. I mean, it's a bowl. little. It's it's a it's just a tiny bit weird though. Let me point out that like he didn't have to do that, right? Like you say, yeah, it's a magic trick. It's sleight of hand. Right. It's great. <laughs> he didn't have to do that right in front of Pine's face, except right. to make sure that the audience saw him do it, so uh-huh. that later, because Pine doesn't catch on at the time when he goes digging no. through the trash. Uh-huh. Uh, he's confused. Where did the SIM cards go? And then he's thinking, wait a second. I did see him throw some pistachio shells into a champagne bottle. Uh, and, you know, so, you know, plus po- plus points for him figuring that out. But also just, just mentioning real quick, like Hugh Laurie didn't need to do that right in front of his face. Right. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> no races. No. Uh but uh, talking about the trash, I really wanted to point out um, Pine's idea. Instead of delivering the package himself, had another employee deliver it. And then he says, by the way, empty the trashes immediately. Uh, you know, um, Roper likes to keep a clean place. Because if the trash is deleted immediately, there's no way to lose track of whatever was thrown away. And, and I liked that. He was, he was right on top of it. So he didn't lose track of the SIM cards. Um, I, I wanted. I really wanted to point that out. That he was just like he's created the distance between himself. He's not the one that took the trash out. He had someone else take it out, and then he immediately went to the trash taken out to find the stuff. So he's not like implicated, quote unquote. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, but um, now that he's got SIM cards and the numbers of the new SIM cards, he reaches out to his old friend Angela, who uh, tried oh, to no, stop. No, no, not not an old friend. Well, uh, I, I was kind of being snarky about it because oh, okay. she describes herself as a friend. But yes, All right. Uh, but he did have her contact and reaches out to her to meet with her. Right, because when she warned him that Sophie was going to be killed, mm-hmm. uh, he did like write down the number. Uh, and I, I like the fact. Did you see like where you know he he didn't um, he didn't throw the number away. He didn't file the number. He like hid it in his father's favorite book. Like in the middle yeah, of it, like a bookmark. Uh, I don't think like as a bookmark because it wasn't sticking out. But I mean, well, for me, yeah, like even in the middle, like yeah, definitely would mark a page. Uh, right. But I think it was just like uh, I, you know, as Pine, I uh-huh. guess I'm thinking. I don't know why or when, but I shouldn't throw this number away. Oh. Uh-huh. I should put it somewhere just in case I need it someday, which maybe is a little stretch and maybe is a little, 
uh, scripty, but I, I kind of like that feels like something I would do. Right. Although also like, I feel like after Sophie's murder, I mean, maybe too, I would have called that number and said like, Hey, what the fuck? What do you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Instead of waiting four years for, right. uh, Richard Roper to just accidentally very coincidentally show up at the, the next. I mean, I'm like trying to flee from the world. Mm-hmm. Almost like I, I feel like maybe like Cairo was I'm, I'm reading into his psychology a bit, but uh, like I said, like he does seem like very much of a loner. We never get any sense of him actually having like deep, deep connections with like friends and family. Right. And maybe Cairo was like a way of him, like thinking like, I'll get away from the world this way. Then the whole Sophie bullshit happened. He said, well, apparently Cairo wasn't far enough. So I'll go, <laughs> so I'll go really far away. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, to the, to the top of the world in Switzerland. And then, but the story catches up with him and Roper shows up. Um, yeah. Right. But uh Yeah. I uh, just, yeah, I just wanted to say, like, I like, I like the fact he's, he's saved the number and he's going to call her and they're going to meet in a restaurant, not at right. the hotel, obviously, which isn't even necessary at that point. Cause Roper has left. Yeah. But I guess it's playing it safe a little bit. You know, I, I don't know, but they meet so that he could deliver her the SIM cards. And, um, this, this is kind of what leads into our cliffhanger for episode two that I kind of wanted to discuss a little bit. It's it's his recruitment by her. Um, and we don't really get to see his answer yet, but I, I wanted to kind of discuss this with you because you and I really like the process of recruitment. Um, we do. We do. Yeah. And, and especially in like a, like a really well done spy story like this, it's, it's really important that the motivations are there. And so she kind of like, he, he was like, here, you do whatever you want with these. I don't want any part of it. And and that's when she starts, like, kind of interrogating or, like, grilling him a little bit. So so why'd you do it? You didn't have to. Do, you know, like, this information fell on her lap, like, twice, you know? Like, he didn't have to do any of this. And she's like, why are you going to risk your reputation as a hotelier? You know, tell me. And, and, and like, he tries to be like, well, you know, I've been in war and in Iraq. I've seen terrible things. And, you know, you're English, he's English, you do something about it. You know, he's got this kind of sense of duty to stop mass weapons. But but then she kind of like prods him about Sophie. And he's like, yeah, whatever. Uh, you know, uh, she wasn't my Sophie. You know, she's nobody to me. You know, and I, and I think she, I, I, you know, you, I'm not sure that she keys in on this, but just from her like dialogue right after that, where she's like, Mr. Pine, what happened to Sophie makes us all involved. It shames me to the bottom of my soul. I know you can't forgive the man who did that. The question is, are you? What are you prepared to do about? You know, it's it's super like like campy with that like you know like in the credits roll. But like, I liked it. What, what, what did you think about this recor- re- like little little tiny scene of like a recruitment of him? Um, I I don't like it. Uh, I I well, I don't like it because of the the Switzerland hotel coincidence. Of right. um, Pine and Roper crossing paths, mm-hmm. and Pine, I mean Pine, knowing that he's got a past with Roper and a debt to settle, and Roper not knowing is very interesting, and and makes we're gonna see like for a very good story. Um, I I question her recruiting him. It, specifically because he has just had contact with Roper. Mm-hmm. So what they're going to set up in the later episodes of a third coincidental <laughs> crossing of the paths, I think is going to seem more suspicious to Roper than it ends up panning out to be. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, that should have been on her list. Uh, like if she's making a list of pros and cons, which she probably should in, in a recruitment decision. Uh, that's a big one in the con list for me. Yeah. Are you talking about in the later episode when they kind of set up the next meeting or are you just talking about 
recruiting him and not being suspicious of him from that meeting. Oh, uh, no. I'm, yeah, I'm speaking of uh, if I'm Angela Burr, uh-huh. uh, in the pro, I'm looking at like the idea of setting up uh, Jonathan Pine, is it? Yeah. Uh, okay. Jonathan Pine as someone to infiltrate. Uh, Roper's organization. I'm making a list of pros and cons, and a big, a big, 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 big con to me is the fact that they met in Switzerland. Like, oh. I, I would rather, I would rather use someone that uh, Roper has never met. Oh, uh, I see, I see. Oh, and you think she kind of jumps the gun a little bit? Like, I mean, we do get to see that scene outside at the night where, like. Roper kind of admires Pine for who he is as a person. Not uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but she doesn't know that. She's just looking at his kind of sense of duty and his like like uh, of the mice scale, right? Like, would you would you say this is like a play to ideology for a recruitment? You know, like. Well, yeah, it's not. I mean, it's not money. Right. It's not compromise, and it's not. Ego. I, mean, it could be I guess little, it could be a little bit. A little, right? little, little bit of ego. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a combination of, of ideology and ego. Uh, so, yeah. No, he makes a great recruit. And over in my pros list, mm-hmm. like, there's a bunch of things that make him make a lot of sense. But I just wanted to flag, like, over in my cons list, you know, uh, if I could find if I could find someone that had all of his qualities – but that hadn't been the night manager when Roper flew into Switzerland. Right. I would pick that person over Jonathan Pine for sure. Right. Right. Cause it would be, a li- you're saying just because of that first meeting, it's a little suspicious that they coincidentally ran into each other. Totally. Again. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, I mean, uh, it's, it's going to be kind of a third coincidence, but it depends on which character you're looking at it from. To 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 Pine, it's only the first you know intersection and the second intersection are a coincidence. To Roper, who has no idea that Pine was in Cairo at all, right. it's only the second and the third that would appear to be a coincidence. Right. But it, I think it would look bad, and I think the I think the show kind of papers over it. I yeah, I definitely I, I definitely can see that. Yeah. Well, I guess I guess we'll see how it plans out in our uh, next coming episodes. Um, that's how that's how episode one ends with the cliffhanger of like, well, what are you prepared to do about it? You know, very typical campy, like uh, you know, just just laying down the gauntlet. You know, like what are you gonna do? You know, are you gonna man up or are you just gonna go hide like you did this time? You know, uh, are you gonna are you gonna go and be the night manager at the next hotel that Roper is gonna stay at? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a little, that's another little kind of weird thing about the structure here is like the show's called the night manager and he's the night manager in two different hotels in the first episode. And you're wondering like, I don't know, where's this going to go? Cause you don't know yet. It's going to oh. go a different way. He's not going to be a hotel manager anymore <laughs> in the, <laughs> like, in the other five episodes. Right. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's not like, uh, I don't know, but that was kind of what was in my head, uh, uh, you know, heading into this series, knowing that it's called the night manager. Like, you know, I, I felt like it was going to be a whole six episodes of, well, first of all, I didn't know that the night manager was in regards to a hotel. Right. You know, uh, but once I found that out, I guess I kind of felt like, like, I mean, my expectation as an audience, uh, my easy assumption was going to be like, at, like, like this whole six episodes is going to all transpire in Cairo. Uh-huh. And it's all going to be like this big soap opera between the Hamids and Roper and Jonathan Pine is going to be like, you know, our every man hotel manager that like, just, I don't know, a secret of my success is his way through to uh, some cool spy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but 
you know, it'll turn out, it'll turn out the night manager is just, it's just a prelude to, Mm -hmm. to the actual, to the actual story. Like, um, which, uh, you know, most of our listeners probably that are listening to this episode, um, are, are either they've seen, they've already seen the entire series or they're just seeing this episode show up in our podcast feed and saying like, Hey, I'm going to check it out and maybe walk (laughs) along with it like episode by episode. But, uh, you know, spoiler alert, he's not going to be a hotel manager uh, in episodes two, two through six. <laughs> well, I can't, I can't promise. I can't promise. I haven't seen six, which, uh, by the way, and I do love the story uh, yeah. very much. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and hold off until uh, for six until right before we record the final episode on this series. Well, that'll be nice. Yeah, that'll be fun. You get a little surprise for the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, can I make some, uh, can I throw in some uh, research notes? Absolutely. Yeah, go right ahead. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's again, it's our, it's our good friend, John Le Carre, uh super famous for his stuff in the 60s, but uh, he kept writing for a very long time. I don't remember what it was, but we mentioned before, like, I think, I think, what was it? Um, what's the one with, uh, what's a most wanted man? Oh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Right. Uh, like, actually, I'm not even sure Correa is dead yet or not. Oh yeah. No, he died a couple of years ago. A couple like of years a year ago. ago. We made but, a post about it. Yeah. But he definitely kept writing like all the way to the end. And yeah. a lot of his stuff has been converted. This one, uh, I think so. This one you say uh, came out in came out in 2017. Is that right? 2016. 2016. Uh, the novel, I believe, was written in '93, and was Carey's first post Cold War novel. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to. I was curious, you know, like what the time frame was, because you know I mostly know Carey for his Cold War stuff yeah um but this is definitely like even when he wrote it it was a post cold war story uh i wondered what the differences were from the original novel they're very few well Um, certainly not after the egyptian revolution of 2011 (laughs) right right (laughs) he didn't predict that in 93 (laughs) right (laughs) of course and it's also it's a it's a pre 9 11 it's a pre 9 11 novel it's yeah. a pre, right? Uh, 90, 93 would be shit. Well, that was after was, the first World Trade bombing. That's the truck. The truck bombing, I think, was 91, okay. wasn't it? But, uh, but uh, uh, the first Iraq war was when? Uh, I think it was around that time. You're talking about Desert Storm, right? Yeah. Uh, Let's check that real quick. Oh. Yeah, it was 91 and 91. So this would have been post uh, Gulf War. Right. So yeah. when he poses his uh his um hero character, his protagonist as having fought in the Gulf War, in the novel he's talking about probably Desert Storm. Mm-hmm. In the series we're talking about like Desert Storm Part 2. <laughs> yeah <laughs> would would be his background right. um but also it's it's pre 911 so we're going to just see like i guess it, i don't want to spoil future episodes but everything if you read the synopsis on on wiki it tracks almost exactly to the exact same story the only differences i can see is that uh uh angela burr was actually leonard burr so they made oh. a change to bring a woman in, oh. uh, probably just to diversify the cast, you know, from older. Well, the director was a woman. I don't know if you. Oh, really? That. Yeah. Uh, hold on. What was her name? Uh, awesome. Uh, yeah. No, I, th- I thought you would like that. Yeah. Night manager. Uh, just real quick. TV miniseries. Uh, creator David Farr. No. Uh, While you're looking that up, though, uh, I'll just say, like, yeah, uh, uh, Leonard, uh, the Burr character got gender swapped. Uh-huh. Um, 
all the other characters are almost identical. The the only real differences are the different locations and the oh. different uh, people that Roper is selling his weapons to. As we're going to see in this, he's mostly going to be selling weapons to the Middle East. Uh-huh. Uh, in the novel, the big arms deal that it focused on was an arms deal to Colombia. Uh-huh. Uh, and he was going to get paid in cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, director was Susan Beer. Awesome. Yeah. I, I, I like the style of this, of this show. It's very, it's very sexy. And, yeah. And v- very much so. And, and it's got a nice feel and it still has that Lake Hare feel to it, but yeah, it's got a nice kind of style to it that we don't see in a lot of other stuff. Just, just walking through the hallways of like the Cairo hotel at night and, um, and just like the settings are, are just like very lavishly like produced in a, in a wonderful way. The outfits are fucking fantastic as they should absolutely. be for this total, yeah. like big dick, rich people energy <laughs> um, <Right>. that, that <laughs> Roper's crew absolutely exudes. Uh, final thing uh, I checked. So I wanted, so I wanted to know, cause you know, like uh Kare is, he's kind of known or at least the the movies we've covered, like will like occasionally some secondary bit character from one novel will show up as a more important character in another. Remember George Smiley? Like before yeah. uh, George Smiley became like a, a main character in Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, and and I think two other novels, he had shown up in the background. Yeah, so, he was in the Spy Who Came from the Cold. Yes. Yeah. Uh yeah, and so I checked and uh the uh there's a couple characters here. You have to do like like two hops through some novels, but this is in the entire like John Lecure. Like they're in the same universe as George Smiley. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So you just got to link the chain together and you'll get there. <laughs> right. The two guys yeah. like uh let's see. Um uh, Roper's primary business partner. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forget his name right now, and we haven't had we haven't really needed to talk about him yet, but right. he's going to become more important later. He's a character in like the Russia House, and there's another character that's going to show up that was in another novel, neither of which had George Smiley. But if you also look up those characters, then they showed up in other novels that did have George Smiley in them. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so I think all all of his novels. I think it's a it's a John Le Carre cinematic universe. <laughs> I was just about to make that joke. <laughs> Great minds, right? <laughs> totally. Yeah, I believe yeah. I believe all of his novels fit together in some yeah. way, which I think is great. It is great. And I mean, with the amount of detail that he puts into his storytelling, I'm I, I'm not surprised. But it's it's definitely wonderful and, and I, it's definitely stuff Todd and I both enjoy but yeah that's the night manager episode one uh, join us next time for uh, the big surprise of episode two yeah should <laughs> should whenever you're listening to this that one should be up in a week uh, yeah. at least our, that's our thinking right now these are going to be weekly and uh, the movie shows are going to be monthly uh, on on top of that, that's the idea right now. We're still playing around with the format, but just to, uh, you know, hang on and and trust us a little bit. And uh, we'll catch you then. The preceding transmission sampled the song "Enter the Party" by Kevin McLeod and sound effects from freesound.org. Attributions and links are found at spieslikeus.net. <laughs>